Hey everybody, welcome back to the Small But Mighty channel here on the Fred Minnick Show. We have uh, something really cool to talk about here today, and that's an auction. We got a cool auction going on over at uh, unicornauctions.com. There are some some A-list A list items up. Linnell's Red Hook Rye. Folks, if you don't know about this one, this is probably, this is probably the most iconic uh, rye whiskey ever bottled at least at least contemporary and we're going to talk about that here in a bit but there's uh, i'm going to preview i'm going to preview uh the linnell's red hook obviously that's the headliner there's also some uh william heaven hill some old rip van winkle prior to there being uh pappy being pappy there's some old rip van winkle in this auction uh, but there's also a lot of Pappy Van Winkle, and there's a lot of little nuggets that you can find in there that are not going to be catching a lot of eyeballs. Like I do a lot of times with an auction, I'm going to preview that. I've done this in the past with other auction sites, and sometimes um, you can find a little a little sliver of hope that someone hasn't found your bottle, and sometimes you get in there and you're like, oh, shit, everybody knows about this particular bottle so yeah these are fun for me to look at and preview because it's a good way to study the status of american whiskey you got to remember in scotch they've been doing auctions for a long time i mean 30 50 years they've been doing auctions with scotch it's only really been reaching into american whiskey at a high level the past five years and so unicornauctions.com uh, was born out of that demand and joining me now is the co-founder of unicornauctions.com aj heindel how you doing man i'm doing good fred how are you i am living the dream living the dream so how did you all how did you all come up with this because this is one of the very few uh american whiskey focused american owned auction houses how'd you all come up with uh unicornauctions.com yeah, definitely. So my partner and I uh, both come from a spirits and hospitality background and had had a decent amount of experience uh, with, like you just mentioned, the overseas markets in Scotland and the UK uh, that focus pretty predominantly on scotch. And uh, through the years of kind of being uh, beverage buyers and uh, beverage directors at different places, bars and venues and things like that, uh, we were just kind of running into a lot of headwinds when it came to sourcing some some very rare stuff. And so kind of started exploring the auction markets all across the world. Obviously realized there wasn't a big dedicated resource here in the States. And uh, that's kind of where the opportunity came to mind. And like you said, in the last couple of years, uh, the bourbon markets have obviously expanded. I've uh, gotten even more popular. And yeah, it seemed like there was a bit of a crime that there wasn't a uh, an option here on, on this side of the ocean for people to kind of chase down those bottles that are, you know, super hard to find. And we had experienced firsthand how cumbersome it is to work with overseas and, you know, moving stuff all over the world is, is expensive and timely and, and a little dangerous. And so we, uh, yeah, we're kind of looking to build a product that both of us were looking for for many years, which is kind of what, what made it simple to, to kind of design our model, I guess. So is this, is this a legal secondary market? Like, how does it how, what are the legalities of, of running an auction site in the states yeah sure so there's specialty licensing kind of uh apart from what you would typically know as an online retailer or something of that sort which gives us uh, opportunity like you said to run a fully legal secondary market resource in the states uh, it's a pretty complex licensing kind of scenario that took mm -hmm. some time for us to build out uh, we were again lucky to be from the industry beforehand and kind of had some experience dealing with the licensing part of the business and yeah after jumping through a lot of hoops and kind of doing what we needed to do to get uh covered logistically and legally uh yeah we were able to to kind of hit the market in a in a fully regulated and above board way where are you all based illinois yeah we're in chicago uh so okay. we've specialty licensing with the state and the city in in illinois and chicago and uh yeah, like I said, it's a bit of a complex scenario, but it was kind of worth diving into, we thought, and we were able to come out on the other side fully regulated and, and ready to operate. Uh, if somebody has a bottle, how do they, what do they do? They just email you and you all, how does that work? Do you all do a consignment? Like, how do you, how do you work with people who have a bottle to sell? Yeah, absolutely. So we're a 100% consignment house. We don't own any of the product that comes through our auctions. It all comes from private collectors all over the States. 
Uh, it's a pretty simple process. Uh, it usually starts with appraisals, which like you said, is kind of done via email mm -hmm. before we meet anybody face to face. And then after we can kind of uh, give some price information to kind of help people make their decisions on what they'd like to sell, uh, they just need to get the bottles to us here in Chicago. And then we kind of become a full service shop after that. We handle the databasing, the marketing, uh, the authentication, and all of the different pieces of the puzzle to get something ready for auction. Uh, we run two auctions a month, uh, usually last mm. for one week each. And mm. then after that, you know, uh, start the fulfillment process of getting people the product that, you know, they find in our auctions. And so, yeah, it's pretty simple. We offer free appraisals and kind of price research to mm. anybody and anyone who's interested, even if you're not looking to sell right away. And if you're just kind of looking for some information on a bottle that you've been storing for a while or something you've been kind of keeping an eye on or something that you found in your grandmother's liquor cabinet or something of that sort. Um, yeah, we're open to, to anyone and everyone on that front. And then once the bottle and you'll, and you'll just do, you'll just do a singular bottle. You don't, doesn't, someone doesn't require an entire lot. Anything and everything, pretty much anything from one bottle to hundreds of bottles. We deal with a, a wide range of different consignment situations with different people. But yeah, from the start, one of the things we wanted to do was be a little bit more inclusive than your standard auction house. Uh, we know the way it works in the bourbon industry. It's not only just one bottle that you chase down. A lot of times that comes with purchasing a whole bunch of other stuff. People have different tastes and kind of widespread opinions on the stuff that they like. And we wanted to be a place where you could obviously come and sell a bottle like the Linnell Red Hook Rye, but also a place where people come and drop off, you know, their Colonel Taylors and their Wellers and, you know, bottles that are a little bit more run of the mill, um, bottles that would typically be rejected and not fit for auction on a lot of our competitors. Um, and yeah, we just wanted to bring as many people on board into the auction process as we could and make it a little bit more of an inclusive thing. Now, today is National Vodka Day, and I do hate vodka. Do you? Do you all? But do you all accept vodka as uh, on the auction? Yeah, we get some vodka that comes through. A lot of it's older, kind of uh, vintage bottlings from the '60s and '70s. There's, of course, the the clicks, the the famous Buffalo Trace vodka that um shows up now and again uh but yeah the same kind of thing unless it's you know open compromised in some sort of way or something that we're not comfortable well aj aj it's compromised because it's vodka so you know <laughs> so that's there's that uh exactly we have to take a little bit of a you know everyday man's approach over here and we try yeah. to not let our opinions on spirits kind of get in the way of right 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 yeah you you all have a business to run i just have my my big mouth to run uh well, what I one of the things that's kind of one of the big trends in um, in whiskey right now is that distilleries are going directly to Christie's and uh, South Bees and other auction houses. Do you do you foresee that being a part of y'all's um, uh, a part of your future business strategies, where you would work with distillers to go to take their rare releases and to put it straight to auction versus W waiting for like an individual to provide you the bottle? Yeah, no, we're not opposed to that at all. Obviously, um, again, kind of our main thesis is uh, the inclusivity and trying to get as many great bottles as we can on our platform so that we can kind of serve the public, you know, in as much mass as possible. And so obviously having relationships directly with the distilleries and, and getting stuff right from the production line uh, would be a great kind of element to add in. Uh, mm -hmm. That's a little bit uh, complex as well. Obviously, legally, there's a bunch of kind of um, different distinctions pretty much that control uh, who can sell what directly and when the distributors have to be involved and things of that sort. And so, like you were mentioning before, it's important to us to maintain everything above board, stay fully regulated. Uh, but at the same time, the more access to awesome bottles that we can get, the, the more we're kind of here for. It. We're all yeah. It. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I think that's, uh, that's, that's the evolution of like the, the U S code. Cause most of that stuff is happening overseas. Like McAllen is taking, mm -hmm. you know, their 81 year old release and Glenn Kitchy will come out with like, you know, 26 year olds. I don't know. I think, I don't think Glenn Kitchy had a 26 year old, but, but there's just like, they go straight to auction. They don't even like give it a shot at retail. So, yeah, exactly. The laws are a little bit different over there, which is why the industry is older there as well, too. Right. Um, there's just a little bit more opportunity for kind of collaboration like that. And it's not quite as strict as it is here in the States. But I still think it would be a wonderful thing, not only just to have the great bottles at auction, but also right. kind of creating the relationships with the producers that kind of, um, you know, created everything from the start that allows our business to operate. I would obviously love to. Well, 
And we are in, we're in the middle of the October no reserves auction, and I'm just looking through this list, and uh, good lord, you all have some hitters, and I just and I know I know you're in a business, and you all are making money, and and the people who are providing the bottles uh, are getting money, but I kind of want to shake the people donating the bottles, like why didn't you drink this? This is awesome whiskey, <laughs> you know? <laughs> I'm like why? Yeah. Uh, but, what I can tell you is even amongst our largest consigners and the people that do do it in a little bit of an investment grade approach, we still see a ton of passion for drinking and for certain stuff that people, you know, can't help but just pop the corks on. And so I think there there's a lot of that going on. There's still a lot of really high end, amazing stuff from 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago mm -hmm. that's, that's been drank. But then, yeah, at the same time, it is hard to to pop the cork on a bottle like the Linnell's red hook or something. Then I'm all, I'm all for the, the people finding it in their basement, um, mm -hmm. at, at, or at an estate sale and they're not part of the community. They're not fans and they, they want to make a buck. I get that. It's the, it's the people who have the passion, you know, I mean, every bottle in here is open and, um, you know, yeah. and I know prior to you doing this, all of yours were too. Yeah. But it's just I kind of I understand, but it, it if we didn't if people didn't hang on to them to put up an auction later, then you and I would never get to enjoy them most likely. So I just yeah exactly. But I, I I'm a curmudgeon, AJ. You know that all <laughs> all too well. Um, I, I know the feeling too. I've got a good collection in our office here, bottles that are open, a lot of some awesome stuff too. And so I think no matter how kind of uh, business minded you get in the world of whiskey, it's still very important to be an avid taster and a drinker and, uh, you know, stick to your passions. Absolutely. So tell me how do you call it the October knows no reserves auction. Does that mean it, you're not, um, it doesn't have a minimum. So if there's a bottle on there, it sells for $5, it sells for $5. Is that exactly. what that means? Yep. So there's reserve pricing on all of our items. Uh, the way we kind of structure everything is in-house. We do the appraising and a lot of the price research and we'll set the mm -hmm. appraisal estimates on the auction. But the owner of the bottle is the one who uh, reserves the right to set the reserve price. Um, and basically throughout a very hot market, obviously, like the last couple of years have been price appreciate like crazy. And there's some times when reserve pricing can get a little bit out of hand and, and a little bit too high. And so uh, MIT's kind of that going on you know obviously we don't want to um, limit people's kind of option to set their reserve price because again we're, we like to be an inclusive auction house not one that kind of tells you what is right and controls the price scenario completely uh, but at the same time we want to kind of reward bottles that have no reserve that uh, kind of promote a little bit more inclusivity like you said it's a ton of fun in the auction format if you you know can bid on something that maybe you can't find or is you know something mm -hmm. that hasn't been found yet in the auction there's opportunities for deals uh, but basically, yeah, for people that do, you know, take the risk of, of no reserves, we just like to reward those people. And so we've been doing some curated auctions specifically based around reserve pricing lately uh, to try to give people a, a dedicated view of, of those items when they come around. So let's take a look at some of the heavy hitters you have. Um, the Linnell's Red Hook Rye, y you know, this is this is going back to my my, you know, I'm just starting out in whiskey. Like I'm probably in uh year two of my career when this is, uh, when this is getting, when these barrels are getting picked between 2006 and 2008. And mm -hmm. that was just a time of like, people had no idea like how good this stuff was. And, yep. and then it starts circling at cir circulating out and like, everyone's like, Oh my God, it's so amazing. Yep. Uh, what are your what are your thoughts on this bottle? Like, there's been some bottles that have gone. This bottle's gone for a lot in other auctions. Where do you, where do you think this is going to land? Uh, so we've got it marked uh, between thirty and forty thousand dollars as our estimate appraisal. Um, mm -hmm. That is all based on other auction data. That's kind of the main resource that we use when it's available. But also at the same time, there's you know not six ten of these being traded every year. It's a very very rare thing, and so. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you have to deal with a little bit of a wider appraisal range for items like that, especially, you know, as legendary as this bottle is. Um, obviously, like you said, the, the four different barrels that they picked in that range between 2006 and 2008 uh, were at kind of a, a halcyon time in the bourbon world. You know, Willett was still doing the custom labels for people. It, it wasn't, you know, mm -hmm. quite as commoditized. Um, obviously, Linnell had the opportunity to 
to create her own label, which is, you know, part of the, the lure. It's, a, it's an amazing label. I'm a big fan of label art personally as well in the whiskey world. Um, but yeah, I know it was, you know, early, early days of Willett kind of making the transition from being just a sourcing house to kind of developing this incredible single barrel program that obviously still today is, is world class. And so I, I completely agree with you. This was in, in the baby days of even knowing about whiskey and the market still kind of getting to know itself in the 21st century. And um, yeah, one of a kind is an understatement. Yeah, and now Linnell is uh, has moved from New York. She's got a she's got a spot in uh, Alabama now, where yeah. she continues spreading the good whiskey gospel. And yep. uh, I'm really high on Linnell. I think she should be in the Bourbon Hall of Fame. I think she's someone who doesn't get enough credit for for the uh, early bourbon movement. And uh, you know, so she, yeah, absolutely. It, if she happens to be watching here, hey, what's going on, Linnell? Hope you're well. Yeah, you deserve it. Also, I think, um, if I'm not wrong, Michael Veach, I think, was involved in the in the pick of the barrel one, the one that we have up for auction, too, who's obviously another big Hall of Famer bourbon guy. Oh, and- boy, yeah. Michael Veach is the, uh, is is a great man. Um, he's-, he's also got a great palate. Doesn't get enough credit for that. Yeah, he's big a- time barrel. This was yeah. a good uh, – that's a good one to have on there. So I, mm-hmm. I bet this one goes – I bet this goes north of 40. I bet it goes really? north of 40,000, yeah, because yeah. – these keep when they pop up the person who didn't get it, it's like fuck i gotta get it you know so yeah. that's it's got the this is this has the greatest fomo of uh, all the <laughs> bottles out there yeah exactly and uh, it's i think yeah so i think it's gonna go for for a lot now the bottle the bottle that i'm actually eyeballing for myself that i could probably squeeze in for my budget and i probably shouldn't even talk about it is the William Heaven Hill 2000, circa 2008, the first edition yeah. uh, barrel strength that they did. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm looking at the bid at where it's at right now and where you all have it estimated. Obviously, people don't know about this bourbon, uh, yep. so I'm going to just shut up about it now because <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm going to I want to take a strong uh, go at it. This is this is not just great, but this is this is Parker Beam. The mm. iconic Parker Beam in his prime, and yep. that bottle just—I've—I've I've never even tasted that one. So yeah, from what I understand, that's one of his most, one of his prouder releases of his obviously very storied career as well. Uh, like you said, I won't go too deep into it, so you can still have a good chance of of bidding yeah. and fend the competition. But we've already said obviously- we've already said too much, AJ. Yeah. We already yeah, said exactly. too much. Uh, but yeah, that's the, I, I love that bottle. And, uh, I, I think I, you know, I, I really do like that. I like Parker was very, I was, Parker was very close to me. Like I was, I spent time with him when he was dying of ALS and I just, I, I bonded with him and we became friends and, and I, anything that he touched when he was in his prime, I, I get really excited about. So this, uh, this is exciting whiskey to, to check out. So yeah, every, um, every single bottle autographed by him too, if I'm not wrong. Oh, wow. Yeah. And another bottle, you know, this is, you know, we're in the Pappy craze now, but prior mm-hmm. to Pappy was just old Rip Van Winkle. And you have a, you have a Lawrenceburg 15 year. That's, yep. that's pretty exciting. Exactly. The pre pre Pappy 15, 15 year, pretty much, uh, all those gold vein all releases are pretty special juice. Obviously, uh, the price points on them obviously indicate that as well, too. Um, but yeah, legendary Lawrenceburg juice. Um, those are other great ones. If you do find the time to open them, they drink every bit of their worth, if you ask me. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, you know, from that age, it wasn't crazy expensive whiskey from the beginning. That's actually a funny thing about the Heaven Hill bottle, too, actually, is, you know, I think that bottle went to market in the gift shop for a $500 MSRP or something like that at the time when the Pappy 20s, you know, were on the shelf at your your regular big box retailer for 60 or 80 bucks or something like that. And so that kind of speaks also to, to Parker's reverence for that bottle, I think. And um, I don't know, this auction is just a great kind of representation of that time period, you know, the early mm. 2000s. And, um, everything was changing, garnering a little bit more attention, but not so much that it was fully commoditized. Things were still moving around. The kind of scene in Kentucky was still evolving. Right. And yeah, that the old Rip Van Winkle 15s are kind of and, a great hallmark of that time. And a, and a young me was walking around with a clean baby face, no gray hair, <laughs> no gut. 
and yeah. uh and, and nothing but dreams of the future soon to yeah, be, be right. beaten down by life and society and yeah, but uh, you made it the, the health <laughs> collection behind you there it looks like uh so. you know what it's 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 a working uh working tasting room yeah that, that obviously it. that but if you saw the other direction it's an absolute, <laughs> it's an absolute shit show right now. I've been I've been uh, back to back to back uh festival weeks and my my um my package room is like up to up to the ceiling yep. damn near and uh, oh it's a, it's a shit show right now AJ. But we're not here to talk about my office. Uh I want to <laughs> I, I, I want to jump in and preview this uh this auction right. So I appreciate you coming in, chatting with me a little bit. And, uh, you know, I got, let me find my little, uh, I got a little buzzer thing that I can play when I, when I, let's see, here we go. So how about it, everybody for, uh, for AJ? I appreciate you having me. That's, that's fancy town technology for me right there. (laughs) All right, brother. Thanks for coming on and, uh, good luck with the auction. Keep us posted on uh, anything you got coming up, especially any any charity related ones. And this is there, is there a charity component to this, or is this just straight not into the auction, business? No, we, not this auction, but we still got some other barrel picks coming down the line that are charity experiences, and okay. that's something that we're kind of uh, not only digging into as a company, but personally, it's great to see that donated barrel picks and those type of experiences are becoming popular on the charity circuit. I think that's just an awesome cause and also an awesome item for people to bid on. I've done it myself going to Buffalo Trace and some of these great places to pick barrels. Yeah. I'm sure you know it's kind of some of the funnest stuff you can do in the industry. And so, yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. You got you to get your liver ready, though, for, uh, yeah. <laughs> for those experiences. A lot of water early in the morning. We'll lot, coconut yeah. water, lots of yeah. water in advance. They just drink a lot of water. Exactly. But thank you. Uh, thank you for having me on, Fred. It's good talking to you. I appreciate it. Absolutely, man. Be safe out there. All right. Same to you. I'll talk to you soon. All right. Cheers. See ya. All right. Now we are going to jump into the preview here. And, uh, this is where I get into my computer screen here. As you can see, the lots are already pretty active. You gotta, you gotta take a look here and that, that Linnell's red hook is at uh, 17.6, and we got some time left on this auction. So I think my I think my uh, uh, my thought that this might jump over to 40,000. Look, it's not going to be my 40,000. It may be your 40,000, but I, I I watch this as not as like to, to pump it up and say, hey everybody go bid. I'm looking at this purely with like popcorn in my hand, completely fascinated. That this thing is going to be dropped. This someone's going to spend a lot of money on this bottle. It's a historic bottle. I think it's cool, but to me, it's like watching. At this point, it's like watching sports. Like this is this is entertainment for me because I sure in the hell can't afford that. Uh, I talked about that William William Heaven Hill bottle. This John Poindexter one. Uh, Poindexter was this was a pretty popular uh, bottle to be prescribed during Prohibition. So I bet you this got prescribed to somebody who was, um, let's just take, take a little closer look in here. Yeah. So this would have been prescribed to somebody during prohibition and let's see, they do, they do a really good job with these photos. Look at that. It's a whole crate of pre prohibition or prohibition era whiskey. Those bottles look great. I actually have a one of these bottles uh, at my house, an empty one that's on display in my living room. Yeah, this is great. Those are nice bottles. So that right there, that's a case of uh, of Prohibition era whiskey. At eighteen one is the current bid. Um, it's actually quite a bit higher than I would have predicted. A lot of these. Uh, Prohibition era whiskeys are not doing that well in auction in comparison because there's just not a lot of the good stuff coming up on on the auction block anymore. And you know the fill levels will be down, but those are in such good condition. I mean, they're obviously getting the right people looking at those. Now, uh, here's where people This is a bottle right here that is in my this is in my top 25. Uh, greatest uh, bourbons I have ever tasted. It's a list I have never published. I just have a list of it. 
and this is on it. This is one of those Wellers, you know, from a time when Stitza Weller was in full operation. But look at this. Look at this bottle. This is gorgeous. Can I zoom in on that? Oh, yeah, I can zoom in on that. That's nice. Yeah, I like this website. Yeah. Look at that gold vein. God, that's beautiful. Oh, man. This, uh, these old original uh, Wellers, 10 years old, you know, just look at that right there. Look at that condition. That is excellent. Excellent condition. And that's a piece of art right there. All right, I'm, I'm drooling all over myself on this one. But that's a bottle. That's a bottle to me. I, I know everyone's all, all gung ho about the Red Hook rye, and they should be. It's awesome. But that to me, that bottle would probably jump to, if I'm creating my list, uh, that bottle's either one or two, with that William Heaven Hill one. That's a good looking bottle. Uh, so I recently was, uh, I emceed an auction and curated an auction for the Speed Art Museum. And there was a 1987 Booker's in up for auction there. And um, I had uh, one of my, my high limit credit card credit cards with me. And I bid, I bid that thing up to 10 grand. I thought my wife was going to strangle me. It ended up going for uh, 16,500. And she was just like, we got, we've got this to pay for. We got that to pay for. You are not buying a bottle of whiskey for ten thousand dollars. Little does she know that I have spent that kind of money stupidly before. So she doesn't know. Fortunately, she doesn't watch my YouTube channel either, so she'll never hear me saying this. So don't go tagging her on social media, telling her that I. I've spent stupid money on bourbon because it came out of a different account that she's not a part of because she's not a part of my company. Listen, you don't need to hear about that stuff. Let's get into these uh, Buffalo Trace. These these OFCs, you see these popping up from time to time, and they they are now kind of usually like connected to like a charity. Uh, they will give them to a charity, and the charity can like resell them, and whoever buys them often turns around and puts them in an auction house. These, uh, I've tasted this one here. This 1980. This is, this would have been when Elmer T. Lee, um, was, was, was with the company and really just great, great whiskey. But if you look at this, uh, look at that packaging, you know, I mean, it's gorgeous. It's just gorgeous. Let's see what else we have here. Yeah, those are those are bottles that you definitely want to take a look at. Oh, we got ourselves some Willet on up in here. Yeah. All right, we got a 23 year Willet. Um, it's a private a private pick of 23 23 year Willet. Let's see which one that is. I mean, right now that bid's a it's a little over 3k. So it's coming in at 127 proof. 23 year I mean that one is uh that one's uh that one might be attainable if you if you have a budget of like 5000 which I don't that one might be attainable now I Park Avenue Liquor in New York uh this is one of my favorite liquor stores in uh in New York and this is a uh this is a gold wax uh, barrel pick. God, this is this is taking me back to the days when you could do this sort of thing. Uh, getting a nine-year will. That's a that's a great one right there. If you if anyone gets any one of these, and they want to bring me in to taste with them, uh, or you want to come out to my place and taste, I'm all about that. I will I will be happy to uh, to fall on the sword and drink some uh, some twenty-three-year, nine-year-old will it with you. And whoever gets to William Heaven Hill, call me. Ooh, a Jefferson's uh, a Jefferson's eighteen year pick from K and L out of California. I did not know that Jefferson's did eighteen year barrel picks. The hell, Trey? I asked you for one of these, and you said no. 
I see I see where you're uh what you're thinking here, Trey. That's uh I did not know this existed. This this might be I don't know if this is the only one that's ever been done. But an eighteen year barrel pick from Jefferson's, that's gonna be good whiskey right there. The seventeen year was in my top five of uh best uh best bourbons of the century. Oh good lord, looky here. You've got the uh the gold foil sixteen year A. H. Hirsch, of course, my my good friend Chuck Cowdery thinks this is the greatest uh the greatest bourbon uh ever made. Uh distilled in nineteen seventy four. Oh wait, is this the uh yeah, distilled in the spring of 1974. Yeah, uh, Cowdery thinks that uh, he's convinced that this is the greatest bourbon ever made. I disagree with him on it a little bit, but it's it's in that top 25. And then another critic, uh, Jim Murray, he fell. In, he was in love with these Rittenhouse Rise, these 25-year-old Rittenhouse Rise. These things, uh, you know, he used to he wanted to like sample like every one of those uh single barrels and i think and i think when he did every one of the single barrels made his best whiskeys of the year made like his top top 50 or something uh, here's uh here's a here's a bottle when i was at whiskey advocate i remember reviewing this and being so pissed off it was in this 375 versus a 750 i think to this day i'm still pissed off about it because it was just one of those things where it's like, why are you spending all that money on a package when the whiskey's the whiskey's so good and you could have like, you know, put it in a bigger bottle. I don't know. I don't know. Some people like the three seven fives. I'm not a big fan of them. But this this bottle is uh that that's great whiskey. We I, I it was it our whiskey of the year, whiskey advocate that year? I don't remember. I, you know what? Hold on. I'm gonna Google that real quick. I can't Google it on my computer because cause then you'll see it. But uh, let's see. I think uh, John E. Fitzgerald, whiskey advocate. I think it was our whiskey of the year when I was there. Yeah, well, we scored it a 96. Was that me reviewing it? Oh, they took my name off of the review. Well, how do you like them apples? Well, scored it a 96. Um, I'm pretty sure we named it Whiskey of the Year. I can't find it. Anyway, back to analyzing this here auction. I want to make sure I didn't uh, move things around too much. Okay, so good there. All right. Uh, we got some Parker's Heritage, 27 year. I've not been that hot on these. I know a lot of people are really hot on the Parker's Heritage, the 27 year. Um, but if you like, if you like the taste of like oak, the sweet oak, that I think you'll like that. The this one, this one's solid right here. This was a, this was a really good one, the Golden Anniversary. But to me, the greatest uh, Parker's Heritage ever released is this one, "The Promise of Hope." This is this one comes out when uh, Parker Parker's diagnosis was made public of ALS, and you know he would later die, of course. And uh, this is when Heaven Hill announced that they would give a portion of the proceeds to the ALS Foundation, which is a foundation I'm obviously a big fan of. Uh, but uh, they. They just do such a great job of like staying in connection with Parker Parker's you know legacy there. And I, the Promise of Hope to me is, will always be my favorite one. Sentimental whiskey's great too, but you know if you can't uh, if you can't have a little sentimental in your life, then you know that's on you. All right, so we got uh, we got the Pappies. We got the Pappies. You don't need me to talk about Pappies. You know all about the Pappies. And if you don't know about the Pappies, well. You know, prepare to stab yourself in the eyeball 35 times because it's a frustrating game. Although the whiskey's good, uh, especially pre 2012. 
Uh, looks like we have some nice Buffalo Trace Antique collection here. Uh, got a 2009 and a 2010 of the Eagle Rare. Oh, that's interesting. You don't see those come up in auction very often. But watch out, folks. A 2003. Yeah, I have a 2003 George T. Stagg. Get out of here. Yeah, this one. This one's hidden in the auction. This is one where once these are gone, they are gone. Uh, this is a 15-year cash shrink coming out in a time when whiskey didn't. People in whiskey didn't know if it was ever going to make a comeback, and boom. One of the greatest uh, stags ever released. Um, hmm. Let's see. God, Lord. Someone put in a lot of BTAC. Holy shit balls. They could rename this auction the BTAC auction. Or have a separate one of, like, call it BTAC. Well, here we go. And then we're getting into some of the scotch. Very nice. Some art bag there. This is the. This is the scotch portion of the auction, so my viewership probably just went down 80%. But if you look at these bottles and you are in scotch, you can see some value here. Um, Craig Latchy, 24 year. I mean, currently at, at uh, four, uh, <laughs> current bid at 250. Wow. I think I saw that in a store for 1,000. Yeah. Well, I'm going to go ahead and hop out of here. It looks like these, uh, all the, it looks like the everything else from here on out of scotch. Let me see if I can, see what we have in Armagnac. See, we'll just stick with the American whiskey side. Well, we got some more, uh, we got some newer, newer brands like the New York Wheat Whiskey, Abraham Bowman Gingerbread. That's a popular one. Got some of the Barrel Craft Spirits, uh, the Cognac Cask. Bardstown Bourbon Company, Discovery Seven, um, had a hundred bucks. Man, that's that's uh, these prices are right on par with retail. Here's one for you, Blackened, a regular old bottle of Blackened. You can get that under retail right now. That's funny. Of course, I spent some time with Metallica, and I'm always been a big Metallica fan. But more importantly. I was, uh, you know, Dave Pickerel meant a lot to me. Here we go. Some of the early, uh, the early little books, the chapter two, chapter four, chapter five, a lot of chapter five. Somebody did not want chapter five anymore. So you could have it. Uh, the old, uh, Michter's small batch. Yeah. That's one of the, one of the bottles I think that I, we've seen come up in auction a lot more. The Michter's, the Michter's products are do really well at auction. And we don't see any, there's none of the 10, 20, 25 years old in this one. Which we've started to see those 20 and 25 year olds outsell Pappy. Okay. Now, this right here is arguably on this is one of the the most bizarre releases I've ever tasted from Woodford Reserve the the five malt and I always tell people you got to taste this to understand how bizarre it is so if you're into getting into exotic time check that one out that's the uh the Woodford Reserve five malt looks like they got a few of those up for auction I wonder how it works if you like uh if you get a bottle and Another bottle comes in cheaper, and it's the exact same one. I wonder if you get, if you get a little uh, refund. I wonder how that works. Anyway, so that's what we have here. We have a a, a deep, deep lineup of items um, in this in this auction. So make sure you go check that out. It's at unicornauctions.com. Unicornauctions.com. And um, I I really am. I'm going to get in there. I'm going to bid on a couple. I might have tipped my hand a little bit, but oh well. Uh, I promised to my wife, if she is watching this, I will not go up to $10,000 on a credit card that you have access to. 
So it'll only be something that you don't have access to and you won't find out anyway because you never watched the show. So, yeah, win-win for me. But, hey, everybody, thanks for tuning in. If you have something that you're interested in bidding on or you something like is, that's a dream for you that you would like to get in auction, put it in the comment section. Uh, I'll give my thoughts on it. And uh, I've been doing a lot of these auctions over the last two decades, and the prices are going up. If you if you would go, if you really would have crack a you know a, a laughter, go back and look at how the auctions went in like 2010. You know, Pappy was like 800, 1200, 1600. It's uh, it's it's crazy now. But uh, but that's gonna do it here. Everybody, thanks for tuning in. Make sure you click that like button, hit subscribe. Tell a friend. It helps grow the small but mighty YouTube channel. Be safe out there, everybody. And remember, vodka sucks unless it's being used for hand sanitizer. Cheers, y'all.